Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I was going to say, those of you just coming in, there's plenty of seats, so you're very welcome indeed. Everybody's extremely welcome, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, those joining us online. Um, it's great that you're all here for our Behind the Headlines. It's the second uh, discussion of the academic year. Um, and we're really thrilled to have with us this evening such a distinguished panel of speakers bringing together, I think, some very diverse viewpoints uh, from across the humanities and beyond. Uh, my name is Jane Olmeyer and I'm the director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is our Art and Humanities Research Institute. And for those of you who don't even know the building, it's the very sort of modern building. Actually, we should have a photograph up here when we're not. Uh, as you go down the ramp on the left-hand side, that's the Trinity Long Room Hub. Um, uh, anyway, uh, behind the headlines is very much part of our signature uh, uh, series of events. Um, we're very grateful to the John Pollard Foundation that supports it. And through this uh, forum, we seek to uh, focus on topics that are being debated in the media or are highly uh, prevalent in our times. And this one just could not be more uh, significant in terms of obviously the budget has really uh, put the focus back on uh, housing again. What we like to do though is to apply the um, long-term perspectives of the arts and humanities and to provide a space for a respectful public discourse um, that actually embraces nuance and combats simplification. Um, and as I say, we feel this is more important that we do this uh, than probably at any other time um, uh, uh, with the rise of fake news and all of that. It, it, it's, things have become so partisan, so divided that we need forums like this where we can really debate, as I say, in a very respectful manner some of these very sensitive issues. Tonight's panel discussion is also part of the launch of the Identities in Transformation lecture series called Trinity and the Changing City. And you'll see these hot pink brochures. I should have one up here. Actually, Daniel, you can maybe wave one around for me. Uh, they're scattered all over the place. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary series uh, where we look at the lived experience of Dublin's citizens through the prism of the arts and humanities and social sciences at, at Trinity. Um, and uh, it's a really fabulous programme, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for uh, some of those lectures. So to tonight, uh, Ireland has just emerged from the economic uh, crash and a period of intense austerity. Um, and the issues surrounding Dublin's housing have escalated. And in tonight's discussion, we aim to address and to interrogate some of these concerns by taking a broad a temporal view on the city's uh, housing. We're very honoured to have a great panel of speakers from the world of heritage and conservation uh, and our own academic uh, experts. For many people, uh, living and working in Dublin City, the housing crisis is at the forefront of, of their minds, of our minds. How did the city come to be in this situation? Uh, and uh, are we able to see an improvement uh, in the hopefully not too distant future? It's from this challenging position that we commence tonight's discussion. Our first speaker will be Lisa Marie Griffith, who's a historian from Trinity and author of numerous books on Dublin. And she's going to take us back to the 18th century and examine the roots of housing problems and how urban authorities and governments failed to tackle these dysfunctions uh, as they emerged. I think Lisa will be reminding us is that actually nothing is ever new. If you look far enough back in history, you'll always uh, uh, find earlier occurrences. Our second speaker uh, this evening is Charles Duggan, who is the Heritage Officer for Dublin City and Project Manager of 14 Henrietta Street, the new museum, which opened last uh, month uh, after a 10-year-long restoration and conservation and research and curatorial uh, 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 and interpretive sort of initiative. I mean, it's been 
a phenomenal project, uh, and I think the checkered history of this former tenement building uh, will be the focus of this talk. I haven't had a chance to visit a 14 Henrietta Street. It's very much on my radar. Has anybody in the audience had a chance actually to visit it yet? A few people. Yeah, I, I'm really, really, really excited to go and obviously looking forward to hearing from Charles this evening. Um, our third panellist is Paula uh, 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 Mayock, who is professor here in Trinity in the School of Social Work and Social Policy. Um, she's the founder of Women's Homelessness in Europe Network, and tonight she'll look at some common misconceptions and stereotypes about the homeless and how these exacerbate both the causes and consequences of homelessness. And then last but not least, um, we're joined by Ronan Lyons from Trinity's Department of Economics. Um, Ronan is a recognised expert on the Irish housing market and he's the author of the quarterly uh, daft.ie reports. So you've probably heard Ronan uh, on the radio, you've seen him on, on television, he also has a weekly column in the uh, Sunday Independent. Uh, tonight he'll be looking at how uh, the city's housing has developed and what policy steps are required to ensure the present crisis does not persist into the future. Um, I, I'm also going to give a bit of a plug for Ronan has an online course uh, entitled Economics of the Property Market. So if any of you are interested in signing up for that course, I'm not even sure what the cost is, but that's irrelevant. It will be about the quality of, of, of the course. Um, uh, I think you can still do so. Look at the Department of Economics' web page for details on that online course. We're also hoping that you will join the conversation uh, this evening. Uh, we will have plenty of time at the end for Q&A because each of our speakers has only got nine minutes. So they're all going to be very disciplined uh, with their time to allow uh, you to ask questions. But we would just remind you that your questions uh, need to be direct and, and short to allow as many people as possible uh, to ask uh, uh, questions. We're also podcasting the discussion tonight and we're also uh, live streaming it on our Facebook page. Um, you can join us on Twitter. So while I'd like you to switch the sound off on your mobile phones, uh, please join us on Twitter using uh, the hashtag uh, PubMatters. So, without further ado, could I uh, ask you to um, join me in welcoming our first speaker this evening, uh, Lisa uh, Griffith. Lisa. Thanks, Jane, and thanks a lot for, for inviting me to take part in the panel. Um, the population of Dublin has been steadily increasing since the 18th century, and as long as it's been increasing, Dublin has struggled to adequately house and take care of its poorest inhabitants. With the 18th century came an economic expansion and a long period of peace. And so out of this, um, Dublin's property developers first came to the fore. Um, the first square to be developed in Dublin was actually developed by Dublin City Council, or Dublin Corporation as it was known then when they laid out Stephen's Green. So at the end of the 17th century, hoping to make some money from rent, they laid out uh, the square, renting out plots of land all around the square. And the idea was they would provide a long lease. Um, wealthy people would come and take up these long leases of perhaps 100 years, and they would build their own houses to very strict specifications, usually using red brick, um, three to four storeys high, a particular width, a certain number of windows. And this idea became so popular, it was quickly taken up by private property developers. And one of the property developers, um, or I suppose one of the names that came out of the 18th century, um, were the Gardner family. And they're a three generational dynasty, really, of property developers. And they would have developed streets that are very well known in the city today, like Henrietta Street which was really the premier address in the city. Um, Sackville Street, of course O'Connell Street, Rutland Square, which is Parnell Square today, um, and of course Gardner Street. And this um, idea of building these Georgian red brick iconic buildings um, meant that the city's wealthy, 
wealthiest inhabitants um, took their place on the finest streets. But Dublin is during this period known as the Gorgeous Mask, and behind these really stunning buildings um, are where the city's poorest inhabitants live. Um, and it's one of the unique qualities of 18th century Dublin that the poorest inhabitants actually live very close to the wealthiest. And there's some very um, built up popular or built up districts um, in the city around this period, like the Liberties in and around St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. Catherine's Parish. And it's these districts that we would usually associate with um, linen weaving and um, artisan crafts in the 18th century. And yet, the, this population are most susceptible to um, economic changes that occur in the 18th century quite quickly. So if there's a decline in demand for linen, for instance, very quickly this can put hundreds or thousands of people living in the Liberties out of work. The houses that they lived in could be 200 years old, they were overcrowded, and there was a huge problem with sanitation in these districts. The next big trend which occurred in housing in Dublin um, in the 19th century was suburbanisation. And this is where private property developers took the idea that the gardeners and Dublin Corporation before them had and they brought it to the outskirts of the city. In this period, Dublin <coughs> city is um, identified as the area between the canals. So between the can Royal Canal, between the Grand Canal, this is Dublin city. And everything outside um, becomes this suburban area. So people like the Earl of Pembroke develop uh, the Pembroke Township. And these are private housing estates like Bulls Bridge, like Rathgar, like Drumcondra, and they are really well facilitated. They have lots of nice amenities like clean running water, access to tram lines, and very quickly the middle and the upper class move to the suburbs. And the working class of Dublin and its poor inhabitants are left in the city centre, and they are left in the tenements that develop. And tenements aren't really a unique um, idea to Dublin. You're going to find tenements all over the world. We associate them in Dublin as being something bad, but they're not. So if we went to Scotland in this, inst or in this period, what we're going to find are purpose-built tenements. Yes, they are small, but they do have better facilities. In Dublin, what takes its place are the three and four-storey buildings that the middle and the upper classes are leaving behind. These buildings have been built to last for maybe 100 years, and now they're stripped out, their fabric is damaged, they are divided, they are subdivided, and as the city's population continues to increase, more and more people are crammed into these buildings. In the middle of the 19th century, between 45 and 50% of Dublin City's inhabitants, sorry, families, live in these one-room tenements. So there could be 100 people or more living in these buildings that had originally been designed for wealthy families and their servants. Um, and this leads to a huge crisis. By the beginning of the 20th century, one of the events that really crystallized um, how bad the living conditions are for these Dubliners was in 1913 when two tenement buildings on Church Street collapsed. Seven people were killed in the collapse of these two buildings. And this awful um, incident brought a huge amount of attention to the housing crisis. An investigation was opened up which looked at how horrendous the living conditions are for most people who are living in Dublin city centre. The Great War, however, meant that housing was put on the back burner, and it wasn't until the new free state was founded um, that housing became an issue that people were prepared to tackle again. Between 1923 and 1931, Dublin Corporation built over 5,000 houses in Dublin city centre. These are largely built on the north side of the city. However, these buildings are targeted at Dublin artisans, so these are people with skills, these are essentially middle class people, and they're targeted 
on a rent to buy scheme. So the idea is it's facilitating them to buy a home. So they really have to have um, money behind them and jobs behind them to be able to do so. And the poorest are left behind, the people who are really struggling um, to actually find adequate housing. The 1931 Housing Act um, encourages corporations to invest. It doubles the grants for social housing. Um, and Dublin Corporation responds very well to this. Between 1932 and 1939, over 7,000 housing units are brought online. 1,700 of these are apartments for the city centre, um, and the rest of these are um, suburban units, uh, mainly in the north side, and it does develop that, but there are also significant units on the south side as well. And one of the big developments that comes out of this, uh, for instance, is Crumlin. But there are problems with the amenities that are being provided in these new suburbs. So one of the horrendous things that happened in Crumlin is that the Garda station is set up long before the first secondary school is established in the locality. House building really slows down in the 1940s and 1950s, and once again in the 1960s, it takes a terrible incident to occur before housing comes back on the radar, and that's in 1963 when three inner city tenements collapse on three different streets within weeks of each other. Two of these collapses led to fatalities, uh, two young children died and uh, an older couple died. And again, this prompts more social housing. And one of the most famous um, social housing initiatives which comes out of this period are the Ballymun Flats, which are built from the mid-1960s onwards. Taking a historical view, there can be a really surprising continuity in the attitudes towards homelessness and poverty in <laughs> Dublin. The problem in Dublin housing is that population steadily increases from 1700. And despite this, we have not steadily built houses to keep pace with this. And it's not something that's gone away, and it is something that we should be able to forecast. We've only built housing in fifths and firsts, and when we do, we focus on housing for the middle and upper classes. For the majority of the last 300 years, we've neglected the people who are most in need of housing and assistance. The narrative of historic neglect has become so ingrained in the institutions who are responsible for housing, it's made it easier for them to ignore these people and their problems right into the present day. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a bit of a more of a myopic view, uh, and I'm looking at uh, 14 heavy industries. And the focus of my talk is the 19th century landlords responsible for the converting of Henry Street's houses to tenements, what their impact on the street was, and ultimately what motivated them. But I would also want to highlight some of the other complex factors that impacted negatively on the people living in Dublin's tenements. First, I will begin, though, with a short synopsis of 14 Henry Street, uh, um, which opened last month as a museum, exploring the Georgian origins and tenement legacies of its own history. Um, so Henriette Street was developed by Luke Gardner in a piecemeal fashion over a 30 year period from the late 1720s. Uh, his last building work in the street um, were, was the construction of 13 to 15 Henrietta Street, which commenced around 1748. In 1751, General Richard, Lord Viscount Moseworth of Swords, moved to number 14 with his second wife, Mary Jenny Usher. Moseworth was MP for Swords, a Privy Councillor, Lieutenant General and Commander in Chief of the Forces in Ireland, before becoming Field Marshal. He was a senior and celebrated resident of Henrietta Street. After the death of Mulgrave in 1758, the house is leased to a succession of high-ranking individuals, including the Right Honourable John Bowes, Lord Chancellor of Ireland, uh, Sir Henry Lucius Bryan of Tremolan Castle, Sir John Holton, who was Bishop of Clare, and later by Charles Dillon Lee, 12th Viscount Dillon, the last peer incidentally to live in number 14. From 1850 to 1860, the house is the headquarters of the encumbered Estates Court which is a NAMA-like entity established in the 19th century, post famine in Ireland, whereby the state took ownership of properties and sold them on, accompanied by a parliamentary title. From 1862 to 1876, the house is occupied by the somewhat raucous families of the Dublin militia, stationed in the nearby Linen Hall Barracks. And then, in 1877, the house is sold by the War Department and converted to tenements. So who were the protagonists um, in the streets transformation to tenements in the late 19th century? 
The first was Thomas Vance, who purchased number 14 in 1877 from the War Department. And then Joseph Mead, who between 1887 and 1892 converted numbers 3 to 10 and 11 to 13, um, Henrietta Street into Thomas. So before discussing Vance and Mead's impact on the street, it is worth looking a little deeper at both men. And in doing so, um, the question arises, um, do they fit the bill as the typical unscrupulous tenant landlord profiteering from the letting out of substandard accommodation to the working poor? I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions. In his obituary, uh, which appeared in the Belfast Newsletter on the 11th of October 18, 1889, Thomas Vance was described as a consistent conservative in his politics. He was a prolific businessman, an early commissioner of the Black, Black, sorry, Black Rock Township, and held directorships with a number of companies, including the Gresham Hotel Company, the Henry Street Warehouse Company, the Dublin United Tramways Company, and upon his death, he left an estate worth over £33,000 in real estate and shares. As noted by Tim Murta, um, whose research uh, for the 14 Henry Street Museum project informs this presentation, Van seemed uh, like the typical um, uh, a stereotype of a callous upper class Dubliner, a product and beneficiary of Victorian capitalism, who made his money and let out property in the city centre, but lived in the affluent suburbs, free from contributing to the city's taxes. On the other hand, in the aftermath of the cholera epidemic in the city in the early 1850s, he built suitable homes for the poor, in inverted commas, um, or more specifically, a series of model lodging houses in Dublin. He opened Vance's buildings on Bishop Street. This was a large-scale complex of lodging houses. Charles Dawson, MP, recalled in 1913 how, quote, Mr. Vance showed me over his reconstructed dwellings in Bishop Street. I saw every appliance for sanitation and comfort, but he showed me his rent book also, which recorded a handsome yearly profit, unquote. Vance clearly had a dual motivation to provide affordable um, but suitable housing for the working classes um, uh, th that was above the norm in standards of accommodation, but also having the less um, uh, satisfactory motivation of making money. In 1854, Vance established another complex off Chapel Lane, um, oh, uh, just sorry, off Bridge Street on Chapel Lane, beside where he had a business premises of Vance and Beers, a wholesale in Woolen and linen merchants. There he built another housing complex, this time comprising multiple lodging houses, a bath and wash house, and even a schoolhouse, for which tenants paid between one and three shillings per week. At number 14, he converted all the principal rooms from basement to attic into 19 tenant flats. The varying room sizes of the original house allowed for configurations of up to three or four subdivisions for the larger front and back rooms. Improvements noted in, the, um, in an 1878 ad, Irish Times ad included um, newly wallpapered walls and a stove for cooking in each fireplace, while for communal use he introduced varsity mains water as well as toilets and gas lighting off the back stairs. While we can only speculate as to Vance's true motivations, his record suggests he went well beyond what one typically expects of a tenement landlord. Was Vance pioneering a type of private sector social infrastructure? Um, not going to answer that. Uh, Vance's estate is listed in, in the 1914 housing report among societies and companies providing housing, which also include the Dublin Arsenal's dwelling company and Dublin Corporation. The report notes that Vance's estate included 180 dwellings housing 780 people. Joseph Mead, really the villain of the piece, um, and the street's other and more prominent tenement landlord was a well-known Dubliner, uh, uh, a Dublin building contractor and politician, owning um, one of the largest building companies in the city with an average of 900 employees. He speculated in house property, particularly in the prestigious Pembroke estate, um, as Lisa would have alluded to, um, a growing suburb in the southeast of the city. So while he was a large suburban, um, so he, while he was building large suburban houses for Dublin's bourgeoisie, he was also earning substantial rents on his properties in Henrietta Street, occupied primarily by the struggling working classes. He played an active role, though, in a number of civic charities and institutions, and publicly advocated for improved housing conditions for the poor. As alderman um, for Dublin City, he presided over weekly meetings of the Public Housing Committee at City Hall, while, uh, which discussed the many causes of um, death and disease in Dublin. When the Association for the Housing of the Very Poor was founded by Charles Cameron in 1898, Joseph Mead was appointed as a director and chairman. Cameron was concerned about the city's casual workers, many of whom were forced to live in stables, cellars, and dark underground spaces. Over a number of years, this association renovated existing houses and built new homes in the liberties of the city. As previously noted, Mead bought up, uh, uh, bought up a total of 10 um, properties on Henrietta Street, uh, where he gained reputation as a, a vilified slum landlord. However, according to the evidence from the 1914 housing inquiry, he carried out a large amount of remodeling work on the street and in the, 18, uh, in the 1880s, and uh, the, the houses had, um, had been converted into a flat system based on the Scotch model. 
and provided with sanitary services to a considerable extent. One inspector noted that Mead had practically reconstructed these houses inside and formed them into flats and provided them um, generally with sanitation or sanitary accommodation. The evidence today suggests that he installed a two-story um, toilet block to the rear of number three Henrietta Street and a five-story toilet block at the rear of number seven, which provided a toilet and wash sink on each floor. So somewhat unfairly, I think, Mead could, um, couldn't shake off his slum landlord image. He was probably uh, the subject of this lampoon sketch, which reads, he is the eminent philanthropist who represents Killamall uh, Ward. He wearily, uh, wearily remarks uh, that his eyesight is growing worse each year, then retires to make room for the doctor, the coroner, and undertaker, and public health goes to sleep again, and the slum owner takes the chair at a large and influential meeting for the better housing of the poor, and makes his audience weep with his heart-rendering descriptions of life in the tenements. It has been pointed out that um, it was only after the death of Vance in 1889 and Mead in 1900 that the street's decline accelerated and its population increased, suggesting the next generation um, did not have the same hands-on approach to the pre as the previous generation for providing and managing working-class housing. After Vance's death, um, the Vance estate, included, including number 14 Henrietta Street, was put in a trust married, managed by his son and sons-in-laws as trustees, of course not his daughters. Um, it is noteworthy that they were all residents in England and their wives and children um, were there with them. Um, after Mead's death, death in 1900, his estate would appear to go fallow, probably resulting from a protracted legal dispute between Mead's son and his second wife. The estate was finally sold in 1810 to the, Royal, to the Hibernian Bank. The following year, the census records 934 people living on Henrietta Street, and including 17 families amounting to 100 people living in number 14. So while rents in number 14 in 1912 were as low as one shilling and sixpence for a small single room flat, a basement flat, they also topped four shillings and um, sixpence for a larger room. And given the size of accommodation provided in the house, these rents would appear to be fairly average for the time, and they don't come near what was sought in an advert which appeared um, in the previous decade uh, for the renting of a three-room flat in number 14 for four shillings and eleven pence, um, which uh, and the note also said to apply to the caretaker. And so I wonder, is this um, evidence of a, a house farmer at work in number 14? <coughs> I'll describe what a house farmer is in a moment. Vance and Mead were the legal owners and landlords of these buildings. However, in Dublin generally, it is not just an issue of ownership. There are multiple layers of agents, house jobbers, middlemen, um, house farmers, and they are uh, known, sorry, uh, sorry, as they were all known, and, and these all, all pushed up the rents. House jobbers would take over a long-term lease on property only to subdivide them into tenements. The house farmers, would often, or who were often just fellow tenants, uh, with the means to take out a short-term lease on another flat uh, or a floor of a house and wrap rent them at exorbitant rates. Research shows that in many cases the legal owner or the landlord uh, who was responsible for the maintenance of the building was often only receiving a third of the rent that was levied. Housing inquiries, okay, John. Um, okay, that, maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> right, so, thank you. Thank you. So, good evening. I'm um, very happy to be here this evening to um, make a contribution, I hope, to this uh, important discussion. So, um, the focus has very much been on, on housing. We can't have a discussion today without, uh, about housing, of course, without referring to homelessness. So for the next eight or nine minutes or so, I'm going to speak specifically about women's homelessness. I want to challenge a number of common um, misconceptions, stereotypes, and myths. And I want to comment briefly on current policy and service responses uh, to women who experience homelessness. Now, everybody here would be familiar with the scale of our homelessness problem, currently close to 10,000 people are homeless in Ireland, with around 1,700 families currently living in homeless accommodation, and the number of dependents in these family totals approximately 3,700 children. Now, a lesser mentioned, I suppose, feature of our homeless figures relates to the composition of these homeless families. Figures published by the Department of Housing over the past months, and indeed, unfortunately, for a number of years now, indicate that between 60 and 70% of the total number of homeless families in the Dublin region are single parent households. The vast majority of these households are headed by a female, 
so that female headed loan parent families are therefore massively overrepresented amongst families experiencing homelessness. The homeless as well as families. In Ireland, 44% of all individuals currently homeless are women, and this figure is well above the European norm, which stands at 20 or 30% in most countries. <coughs> so essentially what we have seen since 2013, 2014, or thereabouts, is a rapid feminization of homelessness in Ireland. Now, particularly in more recent years, um, or in particularly, I'd say the last year, year and a half particularly, the common man mantra that has accompanied the homeless and housing crisis is that homeless can, homelessness can happen to anyone. With many media reports suggesting that any of us in this room are one or two or three paychecks away from homelessness. Um, yes, in theory, perhaps, anyone can potentially become homeless. But in reality, not just anybody becomes homeless. And we can demonstrate this easily by referring to the profile of the homeless population. For example, available statistics from the Central Statistics Office demonstrate an unemployment rate of almost 70% among the homeless, compared to 12.9% of the general population. If we look then to educational levels of attainment, 38% of those living in homeless accommodation do not have any educational qualifications beyond lower secondary level. Just 1% have a third level degree, compared to 42% in the general population, and more than 50% in the 19 to 20, 39 year age group. Homeless is not, homelessness is not randomly dis distributed in the population, and it does not happen to just anybody. Homelessness primarily affects low-income and poor individuals and families, many of those families headed by a female single parent. These individuals and families may simultaneously face other challenges, but let's be clear, poverty is the single most powerful predictor of homelessness. We do need to draw a distinction between individuals who are impacted by the housing crisis, who are many indeed, and those who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. The mantra homelessness can happen to anybody is misleading and distracts from the cultural causes, the structural causes of homelessness. I want to turn now to women's experiences <coughs> of services. Research in Ireland and at a European level has highlighted women's distrust in homeless service um, systems and indeed in the apparatus of the state to respond to their homelessness. However, it is commonly suggested that homelessness is a choice and that homeless people are gaming or scamming the system. In contrast, however, homeless women tend, if anything, to present as homeless at a, at the very, as a very last resort. Our research and research elsewhere throughout Europe has demonstrated <coughs> that women avoid homelessness services and opt instead to live in situations of, of hidden homelessness, to double up with families, friends, friends couch surf and often for prolonged periods. Single women avoid homeless services because they fear for their safety in these male-dominated environments. There is no evidence that homeless women or families are gaming the system, and we would do well to focus our attention and address what we do know and what is evidence-based. For example, if we take the case of women living with the threat or reality of domestic violence, we do have clear evidence here evidence that indicates that women and their children remain in violent homes for longer than they may otherwise do because they are unable to access refuge accommodation. And incidentally, the Department of Housing does not count women living in domestic violence refuges as homeless. So turning finally to current service provision and policy. Well, shelters, hostels and other systems of emergency, short term and medium, uh, term accommodation remain a dominant response to homelessness in Ireland. Put differently, our go-to response is to warehouse um, rather than to house, and this has been the case for decades. Furthermore, reliance on these kinds of responses has increased since 2013 and the publication of the Homeless Policy Statement. And this was despite the commitment made by the then Minister to a housing-led approach to homelessness. 
We are currently opening more and more emergency hospitals and in March 2017 reverted to the provision of transitional housing previously abolished, this time in the form of homeless <coughs> hubs to house homeless families, that is primarily women and their children. Transitional congregate settings of this kind have long since been demonstrated to undermine people's social networks and the functioning capacity of families, thus exacerbating rather than ameliorating the challenges that homeless women and their children confront. Research also points strongly to dimensions of transitional living that bear a greater resemblance to a form of incar incarceration than to having a home. Hubs are yet another crisis response. They serve people badly and they would be very difficult to dismantle in due course. Historically, homeless women were depicted as eccentric bag ladies and as tran transgressors of acceptable and accepted norms of feminine femininity. Viewed as largely unworthy, these women were managed in the main by institutions run by various religious or evangelical communities and government-funded initiatives, all primarily designed to manage women's perceived deviancy. Women were classified as something other than homeless, rendered invisible and simultaneously othered. Today, the language to used to describe women who experience homelessness may be more nuanced, but some clear continuities are evident within both public and policy discourses. In particular, contemporary policy discourses on homelessness and housing have largely ignored gender and the fact that women are disproportionately impacted by our dysfunctional housing system. Policy has also failed to address and respond to the complexity and diversity of women's homelessness. Our continued reliance on what are essentially institutional responses whether hostels, hotels, or hubs, to women's homelessness represents a failure on our part as a society and an indifference towards some of the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming this evening, and I'd like to thank the team at the Long Room Pub um, for, for inviting me to talk. I, I see a couple of my students um, here, uh, and I think they're just fascinated by the idea that I could say something in less than nine minutes. Um, so we'll see how, we'll see how I get on. Um, the, uh, the, I suppose what I wanted to um, convey in the short time I have that everyone else is able to stick to so well um, is an idea of how somebody like me, and I'm an economist by training, how we view a healthy housing system. What are the ingredients of a healthy housing system? And Paul used that word, housing system. We talk about the housing market so much, but actually um, the, the, the market bit is not the complete uh, housing system. There's a non-market bit as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the market and non-market elements of the housing system are complements, not substitutes. They, they go together rather than, than they should be fighting with each other. And I think it's really interesting to listen through the, the, the different talks so far, uh, to go through all the different elements of time and Dublin's history um, and, and see those themes of who provides what and how, um, because that's how we're going to address the, the crisis we have at the moment. One of my areas of research is looking at um, the evolution of the housing market, um, market price uh, for either housing for sale or housing for rent in Dublin over the long run. And uh, the long run currently only stretches back to about 1900 or so. I mean, maybe in due course I'll get back into the, um, the 18th century. The Registry of Deeds goes from 1707, so I have a lot of work to do. Um, but when you look at the evolution of the housing market, you can see over the last 100 years, when you strip out general inflation, because that kind of muddies the waters a little bit, um, but you can see four main housing cycles. Um, the, the prices are falling from 1900 through to about 1917, 1918. These dates are obviously not random. Um, and then they rise strongly up to 1932, and they almost fully recover back to 1900 values. Um, and then they fall to 1941, and then they rise quickly to 1948, 
before falling again, all the way through the, the 1950s crisis um, to the turning point in roughly 1957-58. And that's around about the time Ireland, Inc. got its, its economic model um, sorted. It was going to be a, a platform for, um, uh, in particular, non-European business to access, in particular, European markets. That being a small closed economy was worse than being a small open economy. And in the, um, in, in the period from roughly 1958 up to 1980, there was a big increase in property prices, and some of that was driven by tax policy. There was a big increase in the late 1970s, and that's when they got rid of the annual property tax rates. Um, property prices increased by about a third in 18 months because they got rid of a, a holding cost of, of property. Of course, by the 80s, the debt problems had arisen and, and property prices fell quite a bit. But by 1988-89 in the city, they had turned a corner and they rose for almost 20 years up to 2007. And, and throughout those various episodes, there's different factors at work. Um, clearly, Demand matters, right? If you can find something, we talked about the linen weavers, um, you know, and, and Dublin and Ireland was like a linen economy in the 18th century. Um, but when that changes, you see the effects in, in, in how people live. And when Ireland didn't have something to make, to sell to other countries, um, there was very weak demand to live in Ireland and therefore weak demand for housing. Um, we now have a business model, and I don't think we're going to follow the British route of, of leaving the single market anytime soon. We're not going to give that up, being a base for primarily now American business to access the single market. And as long as we do that, we have very strong demand for housing. But it's not just underlying what I would call real demand, people with jobs and higher incomes, more jobs, more incomes converted to housing. It's also about how you treat the housing market as a government. I mentioned the example of um, uh, of, of property tax, the ground rents as well. Ground rents were a real cost that people paid up until inflation basically made them disappear. Um, and that also pushed up the value of property. We've largely switched those elements up with the central bank rules. Um, the central bank rules take away a lot of the, if you think of housing prices as a kite that get blown around in the winds of supply and demand, um, now you've got a kite that's actually anchored. The central bank rules keep it firmly anchored to the real economy. It still blows around up and down, um, but at least it's got some sort of anchor to the real economy. But that still leaves, uh, I mean economists, I would say this, right? It still leaves supply and demand. And if you don't like those words, think of it as capacity to meet our housing need. Um, and here it comes back to not being just about the market. Um, thinking about how policy has to change and adapt. Um, in some ways, we can think of our housing crisis as being uh, five or six or seven years old. So rents have been rising in Dublin since 2010, 2011, and that was the earliest thing to turn. So, you know, seven years old. But really, a housing crisis that, uh, the bubble and crash episode, which still has a legacy impact today, that is a distraction from when the true problem started to emerge. There is no reason, we know from other countries, there's no reason that housing should ever be expensive as long as you've got the right policy environment. Even in cities with very high demand, Tokyo is not, it's not perfect, but in Tokyo housing is a lot less expensive than in what you typically think of as Anglo-Saxon cities or European cities, um, where rules that are well-meaning in nature have very adverse consequences in terms of housing those on lower incomes. So as we look to reform the, the housing system, I think of three areas that we need to tackle. Um, the first is in how we use land. Think about the, um, was, it, was it Thomas Mead or, or his, his competitor who was a, a shareholder of the Dublin United Tramways Company. Like when the Dublin United Tramways Company set up its depots, it did so because they were on the edge of the city and land was cheap where it set up those depots. Those depots are now in Clontarf, Donnybrook, Phillipsborough. Um, they're still bus depots. But land use that we have now, land use policy is last use, not best use. We need to switch it over to best use. The single easiest way of doing that is to have some cost for misusing land. If you've got something that was an industrial estate in the 60s, but really is now a retail park, um, and should be used at much higher densities, where's the cost on an annual basis? And the land value tax has that effect. Um, it, 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 in, it internalizes the external costs of underutilizing land. The, the second issue, if you think of 
the use of land as really affecting how expensive land is if you're looking to build, uh, and what you do on that land when you do go to build. There's the cost of what you build when you're, you build. So the, the second element is ensuring that we have a construction sector that's fit for purpose. Um, and I think one of the most startling things that I've learned over the last two or three years about analyzing the housing market is just how mismatched our housing is compared to our, our people. The majority of households in this country now, and it's true and even more so in Dublin, comprise one or two persons, but the majority, the vast, vast majority of our housing is built for four or five persons. And, and that's not to say that somebody in a one or two person household can't live in a dwelling made for four or five, if they can afford it. But if you can't afford it, then you've got a, a big problem. Um, and I'll come back to that in, 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 at the end, and I'm, I'm conscious that I've, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to time. The, the first issue is land use, the second issue is an efficient construction sector. How can we make sure that we're, we're building at a reasonable cost compared to our own incomes? Think of the, the analogy of the Kais again, this time for costs, not for mortgages. And the last issue is how social housing is, is funded. And here I think the budget, this being budget week, it's really relevant. Now, healthcare has increased its budget by four and a half billion per year between 2015 and 2018. If even a fraction of that were to go to cost rental, which is where social housing is tied not to the market, but to providing new homes, think of how many people would have a home if we'd started in 2015 and had that kind of budget. So the last thing I, I want to say is it comes back to the, the nature of the housing we need. When we think about building homes, we, we often allied the word home into house. We need to build houses. I'm going to say, actually, we don't need a single extra house in this country. What we need is every other form of housing. We need everything from student accommodation through to assisted living complexes. Everything that's not a family home, we have a significant shortage of. And to put some numbers on it to close, the last thing I'll say, Roughly speaking, Dublin needs 100,000 apartments of all kinds every decade for the next five decades. That's 200 a week, every week, till we're all dead. <laughs> Sorry, some of the students will probably still around in the uh, 27th, 28th, but probably going to be gone. Uh, that's the, the, the scale of the challenge. It's not a five or six year problem. This is a decadal problem. Um, and we know the solutions, but it's really about getting over the inertia and, and taking the, the expensive and sometimes painful actions that we need to solve it. So I look forward to the discussion, and thanks again for your attention. Thanks, Thank you. thanks so much for four absolutely fabulous uh, uh, talks, um, and thank you very much for keeping to time. Much appreciated. Um, it's over to you guys now for uh, questions, not comments though, so if you could just ask questions um, uh, uh, sort of succinctly and clearly, we'd really appreciate it. Um, you do need microphones, um, so there's a microphone here, is there just one mic, yeah? Um, uh, so, so if you'd like to put your hands up so we can get a sense of where the questions are coming from. So there's one here in the middle, uh, I was going to say there's always one right in the middle. Um, and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, sir, and we're going to take two or three questions. We'll come back to the panel, but if we start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Andy McLaughlin. I'm a student here. Um, and my question is for Paula Maya. You mentioned near the end of your speech that um, our responses to home, uh, women's homelessness failed to address the complexity and diversity of their needs, and I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Thanks very much. So, Andy? Yes, just pass it along. Hey, um, I've got two questions. What's your name? Uh, sorry, it's Sheila. Um, I've got two questions. One to Paula. Um, what is the actual breakdown of homelessness? So there's 44% that are female. What's the rest of the breakdown with that? Um, and kind of age profiles and all that kind of carry on. And then for the last fellow that spoke, Cronin. Um, when you're looking at, say, you were saying about the 100,000 apartments every decade for five decades, how much of a percentage of that is for social housing within that provision? And how, yeah, how would you assess that long term? Perspective? Thanks very much, Sheila. Really, more questions? Uh, just uh, at the back, this lady here. Don't, we'll try and get to everybody, so please go. Uh, hi, my name is Mabel Regan, and I'm a student here. And my question is just for uh, Roman in terms of uh, the rental market and the fact that we don't have a culture of people having jobs for life. And 20 years ago, a nurse in a guard could buy a house. Now they can't. So I just was wondering about sustainability. 
We've really got four questions there. We'll come to you, sir, in the next round. So we're going to go back to the panel. There were questions directed at Ronan and um, at, 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 uh, 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 at Paula. However, um, feel free to join in Lisa and uh, Charles. We start with you, Paula. Would you, would you mind using the mic? Yeah. Okay, so um, there was a question. You asked a question there about um, uh, the complexity of women's needs. Um, I think one of uh, the key characteristics of, of um, and I think anybody who, who has worked in homelessness services will agree that traditionally homelessness services ha were geared towards you know, the archetypal male homeless person, often um, anything between, often older actually, but not necessarily, also young men. So um, with, with that in mind, um, basically services were, are, and remain not geared up to deal with women's issues. Um, the, the environments are male dominated, which can be very threatening for women because many of these women, and certainly if we look at any sample of women who've experienced homelessness, particularly single women who've experienced homelessness, they tend to have histories of, um, of where they have been victimized, there's, there's some level of gender-based violence, and so on. In these services, um, uh, these services are chaotic. There isn't the time, there isn't the, there isn't the training to address these specific kinds of complex needs. And in fact, the research that I, I have done here suggests that, if anything, sometimes service providers don't want to, you know, fear opening up, quote unquote, a can of worms in terms of, because they don't feel capable in these uh, very emergency, chaotic, services. Um, so I think that, um, yes, there has been uh, this um, tendency to, to, to gear up our system naturally because previously there were more men, more men uh, or a greater, far greater proportion of men in the system. Do you want to, the breakdown of homelessness? Maybe? Yes, okay. The, so so you've got the mic. Yes, sure. There was a question about for the 44% female and I made the point that this um, uh, this figure is well above the European average, which um, normally there's no more than one third um, of the population, um, and in fact, in some countries, it's only 20, 18 to 20 percent female. Um, so, in terms of the age profile, at the moment, um, if, uh, fa the age profile for families is young women with one or two or three children. So, they're young, young meaning in their 20s or their 30s. Uh, um, with one or two or three children. The age profile for singles is a bit more diverse, um, so, um, but, it, but we have a far larger youth homeless population than we did previously, far, uh, much, much bigger. And um, also, actually, we have a significant, and people may not understand this, we have a, a reasonably large older population. And in fact, I heard, I was at a paper delivered recently looking at cohort effects in the United States and what they are seeing are bulges at the bottom and bulges at the top of the homeless uh, in age. So a large number of young people, large number of older people, and the point being that these again, a bit like the question about women and their needs, you know, younger people in the homeless population will have extremely different needs to an older cohort. Okay. Thanks, Paul. If you pass over to Ronan, and then we'll come back to you, Lisa. So um, there, there were two questions there. One was about um, what percentage of the overall figure um, I gave is, is social versus market. And uh, what I'm going to call a related question around uh, rental and the, and the sustainability of rental. Um, to me, to go to the first question, the percentage social is effectively a choice that we make as a society. Uh, and what I mean by that is, when we're designing our minimum standards, we should do so with reference, with explicit reference to our own incomes and our, what we can afford. So suppose we decided as a society that we wanted to support the bottom third of the income distribution. That means, by sort of logical implication, that the top two thirds has to be able to afford what the market will provide. Therefore, you have to reverse engineer someone at the 33rd percent up in the income distribution and say, what do they have on a monthly basis and what does that convert to and when you sort of capitalize it up and say, what can that build? And if you don't like the answer, then we need to change some of the maths of construction. Um, but that 
that's very far from how we do things currently. Uh, I think, the, uh, I, I uh, confess this exercise is probably about 18 months out of date. When I looked at the Dublin City Council minimum spec for a two bedroom apartment, my estimate was that only the richest 10% of people will be able to afford the minimum spec. And social housing is covering less than 10% at the bottom. So you've got this huge category that are hidden in demand, that there's no way the market's going to provide new apartments for them, um, and there's no way social housing is going to either. And for me, that middle group has to disappear completely. We need to think about uh, our minimum standards based on our, our incomes, uh, and that, that is going to mean that we're going to have to be more cognizant of trade-offs. I get into rows with architects who say you can't change standards around sunlight and daylight hours um, um, for minimum specifications. And I say, well, what if that means that instead of living close to their work, they have to live an hour um, away from the work? Because that's what is viable, because you build three-bed semis in Mullingar rather than building them apartments in the city. If that's our choice, I'd rather have an hour less sunlight or daylight um, per week. You know, that's the, it's trade-offs, and that's what economists, I guess, are, are trained to think of, that there's always a trade-off here. It's not a, a free um, change if you make a change in regulation. And that actually ties into the question about rental and, um, uh, say, like the idea of a job for life. For me, uh, if we think about, say, supporting the bottom third, that support should be based on how much help you need. That if you're at the, just below the, the, that cutoff of a third, that the support you get is much smaller, you need much less support than someone who's really got no income at all. That they, they need a significant income top to be able to afford um, that, uh, that, that minimum specification home. Um, uh, and, and that connects to uh, uncertain income or uncertain employment. That if we have a system in place where you've effectively got a universal income for housing, let alone, we can leave the other topic about universal income in general for a different behind the headlines event. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you have uh, a cost rental setup so that, that social housing is built on how much it costs to provide new homes, not based on what the market is doing at the moment, um, and the subsidy you get is based on what your income situation is at the moment, then um, it's not irrelevant that your income is insecure, but it's irrelevant to the fact that you need a home, uh, that you have somewhere, and if your income dips below, that's okay, because you'll get a top up. But to do that, and this comes back to the final point I made, to do that we as a society need to say 200 million a year, euro a year or whatever is not enough for a social housing subsidy. It needs to be more like 2 billion euro a year. And that's doable. It's only 1% of, of the size of the economy. Um, so it's not an unreasonable request, but we need to make that explicit choice. Thank you very much, Ronan. Lisa. Thank you. Sorry, just one of the things that you said, Paul, it kind of struck me about the archetype, archetypal homeless person. Um, and something I was reading the other day uh, to prepare for this, Jonathan Swift actually commented that um, for him, the majority of um, homeless people that he could see and people begging on the street were women and their families. So, you know, there's just this continuity of problems and there was a real fear, like dating back to the 18th century, about opening up these services. So <coughs> during the 18th century, Dublin had two houses of industry and they're kind of an early form of workhouse and they both had Bangline hospitals associated with them. So they're a type of orphanage and women come from all over Ireland to bring their children there and it gets to such a state because that these districts don't want to be fine taking care of children from another parish or from another district that they pay parish fields to go and find the mother of some of mothers of some of these children who are being um, dropping off these children. So there's a real fear there of opening up services. Yes. Struck me as a parallel. Oh. So Thank you, Lisa. Charles, do you want to get involved? Is there any um, point you'd like to make? Uh, no. That's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. Just if you had. We'll take another round of questions. So we're going to go up at the. Uh, well, I was going to say, this gentleman has been very persistent. So in, in the white shirt, <laughs> except of course she can't get to you. Uh, there we are. Eve is very agile. And then. <laughs> We'll do the middle, and then I'll come to you at the back. So there's a sort of in the middle here. Please, sir. Hello, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that um, talk. I uh, enjoyed it. But my question is... And your name? Oh, sorry, thank you very Jim Barford. Thank you. Has any professional body uh, done a study of the inertia factors that have impeded the housing building? That is, has there been a list made factor by factor um, 
is there a clear loading uh, sequence of factors that show um, how little building has been done. Um, so my idea is like, uh, let's take responsibility. Do you know what, can you just it? leave it there? Don't go into detail, that's great. If you could just pass the mic up to, just behind, again, if you just pass the mic back up. Hello, uh, my name is Ross, and uh, my question is for the uh, general panel. Um, so, do you think uh, Dublin residents and Irish people in general need a kind of huge shift in culture, whether that's from um, owning versus renting point of view, and also, as mentioned previously, around living in an apartment rather than a house? So, like, uh, just around the culture element. Good, thank you very much. And there's somebody behind you again. Did somebody have their hand up behind? Yes, just. Pass the mic, There's just pass it behind you, and there's a gentleman in a green shirt, I think. Please. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name's Oshin. Uh, my question's for Lisa. One of the uh, things that struck me, I'm quite involved in some of the housing campaigns going on at the moment, is the continuity in which you actually have a uh, century on buildings that were tenements essentially being tenements again. And I guess, could you kind of speak to the, the historical Kind of the, the fact that you have these buildings that now kind of being tenements, stopped being tenements, being tenements again, and stopped being tenements in kind of different forms, and, and why it is that these areas remain so stubbornly, you know, for example, around Mount Joe Square now for almost a century and a half, more or less, uh, and are there factors that seem to be leading to that? Thanks, Sashin. I think there's another question, so just pass it to this man just in front of you. I was going to say with the tie, many people have ties on, but please, sir, go ahead. Hi, uh, my question is for the panel. And your name? Uh, my name is Andrew Moore. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in, uh, in the, uh, the panel's, uh, you know, what the panel thinks of two of the proposed solutions that I've encountered. Uh, one is the use of modular or prefabricated structures to kind of quickly and cheaply meet the demand that we're facing. And the second was a proposal that I heard on a recent prime time episode about how a large proportion of the homelessness problem could be addressed by having local authorities make better use of their allocation of their current houses. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa, why don't we start with you and Hashim's question about the tenements, and then we can sort of go yeah. back to, uh, I was going to say, I suspect Ronan and, uh, and, and, and Paula. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of... Oh, hang on a minute, we need the mic open. Yeah. Sorry. And again, Charles, you may want to come on, on that one as well. <coughs> You, sorry about that. Um, in terms of continuity of the building's use, yeah, it, it can be quite stark. I, know, I remember explaining, I used to work as a tour guide, which is why I thought I could go with that mic, but um, <laughs> I remember explaining to a, a tour guide who was our American visitor to the city who was amazed about how old everything was, that at the time I was living in a Georgian building, so I was living in a building that was 300 years old, and they thought this was amazing, and I was starting to explain, no, it's actually because I can't afford them, and some are fancier, but... Um, I mean, there is, I suppose, a tension there in the city in how we use these buildings um, in terms of they're there, do we continue to use them for residents, how do we bring them up to scratch um, as modern units and I think it's kind of <coughs> conservation um, of, you know, should we tear them down to make way for the 100,000 apartments that we need or, or do we keep them? I'm not sure what the solution is there. I mean, it is recognisably a problem. Um, I first of all um, think that the, it's not that there's, they've gone back into tenement use. Um, I think the subdivision of houses, particularly the Gardner Estate, has continued throughout the 20th century. Most of these houses, if they're up for sale, they are described as pre-63, which is before the Planning Act. And so their uses are historical uses of subdividing rooms into uh, beds of accommodation. Um, I think you have to be careful in equating conditions of these subdivided properties, which are by no means pleasant today, with that of the early 20th century. I think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a facetious parallel. I think the overcrowding that's prevalent in the north side that's been documented by, um, uh, by the Dublin Enquirer and others is really telling. Um, but, and why is it happening, particularly in the north inner city? And I'm not absolutely certain of this, but perhaps it has something to do with how the Gardner Estate was managed. Um, the Gardner Estate was um, basically bankrupted by the mid-19th century. And when it was sold, it was sold in a piecemeal fashion. 
uh, quite often to uh, one-off landlords buying up the property and renting it out. Whereas if you look at, say, the Pembroke estate, which was supremely well managed all the way through its, um, its history, uh, you don't get the same problems there by any means. So I think there is historical reasons and the, I think the continuity is there. I don't think that we have gone back to tenants. I think the, the subdivision of these houses, they've never been anything but subdivided and used as accommodation in the north inner city of Dublin. It's also really interesting to see if you were to map the um, social housing in the north inner city of Dublin. I did this exercise a few years ago where um, I just wanted to pass out, well, okay, if, if we're calling Dublin a Georgian city, well, how much Georgian is left? So mm -hmm. I did a colour coded map and plotted the entire of the north inner city. And so much of the area that's not Georgian is actually taken over now by um, flat buildings uh, built from the 1930s onwards. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really interesting that these flat buildings have replaced multiple our, uh, Georgian houses subdivided to accommodation. I think it's a perfectly good thing and you know that they're as well maintained as they are is great. Just behind 14 Henrietta Street to go back to what I know best. Um, there is Henry, uh, Henrietta House which is a complex of two blocks of um, uh, houses built or flats built by Herbert Sims uh, in 1937 um, and, uh, and they are in you know perfect condition and housing you know 44 um, families, diverse families in the inner city. Yeah. Can you pass it maybe to Ronan? There are a couple of questions. Uh, the inertia factors about the shift in culture around owning versus uh, renting, and then <coughs> solutions. There's a lot there, Ronan. But yeah, I'll do my best. And I mean, would have sneak in uh, a thought for us as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what I think I find fascinating is that that some have persisted, but others have not. So if you look at uh, Ranla and uh, Rathmines and uh, Portobello and Stony Banner. Um, those areas had been subdivided quite a bit um, in the 20th century and converted to bedsit, and a lot of them went back. And I think it's a really interesting research question, and but it may be small historical contingencies that matter um, for why some areas bounce back, so to speak, in inverted commas, and others uh, others don't. But I'll, I'll try and stick um, uh, after that. I'll try and stick to my brief. Um, Jim, you, you, um, I think if I. If I follow your question, I think I agree that the lack of an understanding of why it's so expensive to build, in particular to build apartments, um, is at the root of um, our current, the short-term nature of the, of the housing. There's a long-term nature and a short-term nature. The long-term nature is land use, and the short-term nature is a combination of poor social housing policy and high construction costs. If you're thinking about free land and you want to build two-bed apartments, um, the minimum monthly rent you can charge is probably about 1850 to 2000 euro a month. Um, uh, and that's just not, that's, that, I mean, whatever about Dublin, uh, you're not going to get that in corporate world for, or anyone else that also need apartments. So we need an open, transparent audit of costs, comparing what we build in Dublin to what we build in Amsterdam or Barcelona or Copenhagen or Boston or cities that we might think of as, as our comparators. I'm sorry, Earl. My question really was, uh, why do we allow these factors? Can we, not, we can put a man on Mars in a few years' time. Why are we letting this? Is there some point? Sorry. Yeah, I, I, and I can't answer. I've been trying to scratch at this for a number of years, and I, I can't get a good answer as to why. Okay, but it needs to happen. Um, there was um, uh, a really interesting question, and I just missed the name, um, uh, around culture. Uh, and I know Paula was dispelling myths earlier, and I wanted to dispel two myths that we won't live in apartments and that we won't rent. Um, Ireland has one of the highest percentage renting uh, in Europe. Uh, we think of ourselves as one of the lowest, but we're actually one of the highest percentages renting we've got. Yes, we're significantly lower um, than Germany, Austria, or Switzerland, but they're outliers. Um, once you go past those three, um, you've got countries like France, Ireland, the UK, where about a third of people rent. Um, and the other one is we won't live in apartments. We might rent, but we won't live in apartments. We will rent homes. A house is easy. I didn't make the same mistake there. Um, uh, and the best evidence I can think of to, to dispel that myth is look at the apartment blocks that have been built in suburban locations in the last 10 years. Uh, they are disproportionately lived in by the over 60s. So it's not even that, well, whatever about young people today, they might live in apartments. You'll never get older Irish people live in apartments. Actually, once you provide good quality apartments in locations that they're interested in, mm. people will will live in apartments and people will rent. So I actually am a lot less worried about culture than, than some might be. 
Um, and then there's sorry, there was one last. Oh yeah, uh, quickly, modular housing. Uh, my quick answer on that would be any form of innovation is worth a try as long as we meet basic um, standards. And in terms of local authority housing, it's shocking that local authorities don't have an inventory of who owns what and who lives where, like their peers elsewhere in Europe do. They, sorry, they don't? They don't. Wow. Yeah. Paula, do you want to join the conversation? Yeah, I suppose just um, on the home, <clears throat> home ownership and uh, Ron has pointed out that we actually do, and people maybe don't realise that we do have such a high proportion of renters. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's much newer though in, in our society and certainly I think we still hang on to the um, the aspiration of home ownership you know very I think that's very strong in us and I suppose what I feel is that to move if we're to move away from that culture if indeed that would be a good thing um, we we do need quality apartments you know for to move towards the, the i mean some of what was built during the celtic tiger i mean they're not suitable for families or small families they're not even suitable for a couple uh, they're so you know one bedroom apartments that don't even have a balcony you know so i do think that if we you know th that it is about you know what we build and the quality of our bills in that regard um, and uh, and I think that that it changed if we're to change that culture because I think people live living in apartments but it's with the aspiration of buying buying a home mm -hmm. all right but maybe we, uh, this I don't know is there anyone up in this corner we haven't been up here maybe there aren't any questions oh my goodness you're all I was gonna say okay there's a gentleman uh, here Can you put your hand up sir in the black jacket and then I was going to say we've had a lot of guys asking questions, so I'm going to let you be the final one if that's okay. Please. Oh, uh, this, 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 yeah, you too. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Just uh, your name. My name is Desmond. Yeah. Um, we were on holidays to some time ago in Bilbao, and just uh, saying the way it seems to operate there would be you might have ten stories high, but on the very very bottom layer, it struck me very forcibly that everybody came down. There was a little shop. There was this, that, and the other. And there was, there was place where people could play. So it was very, I felt, very um, community orientated. But nobody's actually mentioned the idea of So your question is? My question is, can, can you have 10 stories with flats and the idea then that you would build around that a community sort of setup? Okay, thank you very much. You pass it just here. Hi, uh, my name is Claire Brown. I have a question for Paula. You said that the discourse in homelessness doesn't recognise the feminisation of homelessness and that the services that are provided aren't fit for purpose. I just wondered what you think a fit for purpose system would look like for mm -hmm. women. Is there an exemplar in some other country that we could take the lead from? And just one question for Ronan as well. If Leo Varadkar was to call you up and ask you for advice on the homeless crisis, what 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 thing would you or what, what would you suggest to him? Something that could change things and something that could move it on a bit. Two great questions. Thank you very much. And then there's a, a, a lady here uh, in the middle. My name is Noreen, and it's a question for Ronan, and it's in relation to Jim's question. Uh, it just it came up for me. Uh, not so long ago, a couple of months ago, O'Coolan came out and said they could build houses for hundred for a family. For 175,000, how does it cost so much uh, for developers to build? Thank you very much. So, uh, you know what? I, I, we, we, we're just running out of time because we need to finish at eight, and that's so I'm terrible. So, you come and ask them at the end. Um, Desmond and Bill Bow around the community. Does anybody want to, 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 to take that one on? And then we've got feminisation, uh, advice for Leo. Actually, why don't we start with feminisation one, Paula? Would you mind? And, and what would fit for purpose uh, uh, look like? Collect, do you mean, fit, fit, do you mean in, in what sector? I, I just mean that for emergency services, you, you, you had referenced homeless houses being suitable. Okay. Okay. You know, what, what, what would a suitable system look like? Um, well, my criticism of homeless hubs and all of oh, you see, the, the reality is that we have had more and more emergency uh, accommodation because of the crisis of homelessness. And people say that hubs are better than hotels, but that doesn't make them good enough. And we always seem to be resorting to what is just barely, you know, isn't that good enough, you know, or, or it will have to do. So we're constantly firefighting. 
We're never planning. It's a crisis response. And it's not, I, my view is that it's just not good enough for vulnerable women and families. Now, I accept that. You see, the disturbing part is in this, in the, in the 2019, in our recent budget, that we have, we, we have, we need to invest more again in emergency services. And this is, this is disastrous. Because if, 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 if government is saying, I was saying up front, we're investing even more, I can't remember the figure, in, in emergency, it means that they know that there's going to be an, another flow into, the, the flow into homelessness, is, or, or that we're not, our numbers aren't going to significantly reduce. And I think that at the moment, um, in our crisis, a, a fit for purpose response has got to focus on prevention. We are not going to make a dent in our homelessness figures unless we can stop people coming in. If we can halt it very significantly, we might be able to stop people coming in, but if we can halt it at the moment, we have then we would at least be trying to move to, you know, because people are exiting homelessness at the moment. The problem is that there are, there are more people coming in in relation to families. But if we could halt the people coming in, then we'd have some hope of decreasing the overall homelessness figures and getting people into housing. So I think that, you know, we need a distinct and, and a much more sophisticated um, a preventive um, set of measures and strategies that specifically target single-headed households. Right? Just while the Desmond's uh, question about community, just while you've got the mic, have you got anything that you want to say there? You may not. The community high-rise, um, and these are, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it sort of uh, is related to the point I made about having fit for purpose apartments for people to actually live their lives in as opposed to rent for three months and, and so on. Um, and uh, I think the high rise thing, see, we've always been, we've had a difficulty with high rise, with going up, <laughs> you know, so we, and it tends to be objected to and so on. We live, we live in a low rise city, so it's, it's a, I mean, if I, it's, not, it's not that I would be against it, but certainly if we're to build high rise apartments, we need, we need serious amenities to accompany them, I feel. Which is so, so what you're describing. Yeah. yeah. We pass over to Ronan? Because again, I think that the, the advice, if you had Leo on the phone, uh, what would you say to him? And also the cost um, question as well. Yeah, um, so as it happens, um, the, the journal had a tweet this morning, which was um, <coughs> their interview with Leo after the budget, where he said, if there's no magic potion uh, that will get homes, um, more homes built faster. Um, uh, and my response to that was magic potion equals um, <laughs> land value tax and cost rental, which would mean putting a budget of two to two and a half billion aside per year for social housing. And while you're doing that, review construction costs to make sure that we're not wasting money. Um, because it's not just about saying we'll spend two billion. Health has shown us we can, if you can throw money at it, you might. If that's not a, a it's necessarily not sufficient for solving the problem. Um, so uh, those three elements: land value, tax, cost, rental, and, and reviewing construction costs are, are what I would say uh, and have said to ministers in the past, and will continue to say it is the solution. Um, uh, I'm, I'm convinced anyway. Uh, in, in relation to that particular example um, in uh, in Valley One, the um, what we need is, if that were scalable, it would have happened by now. The, the problem is that's not scalable. For, for, for one, the example I gave is an apartment, and apartments have a different cost structure um, to, to, to low density housing. Now, that was row housing, so it's not like they're detached homes, but it is low density housing. It's, it's basically one, I don't think it was two units on top of each other. So there's, uh, there's, uh, it's, 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 it's not a like for like comparison in that sense, but perhaps more importantly, the specifications on those houses. The council agreed to them because they were social housing, as in people in social housing can live in those, but not normal people. And I, I, I fundamentally object to the idea that the minimum specification for normal people um, is different to the minimum specification for social housing. Wow. I just think that's complete um, uh, aberration or abdication of housing as a fundamental right. So you're saying um, they're building sub, sub, sub 
standard housing. No, and, and this is the thing, the homes are perfectly good quality, um, but they don't meet the council's own guidelines around what a minimum spec home should be. Um, uh, and this gets on to the broader point, which actually brings in the Bilbao question, um, which is that I think our councils and our policymakers at national level have confused targets with minimums. Mm -hmm. I think every council should have, if you're going to build an apartment block, we would like you to have the following 10 or 12 elements to make sure that this is a home that people feel comfortable living in long term if that's what they want to do. And if you're going to deviate from any of those 10, you've got to explain why. And what they have said instead is, if you don't have 80% of your units dual facing, we're not going to give you planning permission. And what that does is, the planning permissions don't go in there. And then we say, well actually we didn't mean that, and if you'd come to us with a proposal that was good, we probably would have been able to, um, to bend the rules a little bit. When you talk to the international development community, they see the rules written down. They don't go, oh well, it's Ireland, there's a way around those rules. Um, <laughs> they, they say, well they're the rules, and we can't make it work, so we're not going to come into Ireland. And that's really what I'm, I'm less curious about what the Irish developers think, and more curious about what the international guys who build 200 apartments um, every, uh, every week in other cities, what they would do if they were here. Do you know that the, the lady at the back has been very persistent. We do have time for one more quick question. Um, oh, I know. It's just that time is not our friend. So we'll take two more very, very quickly and then we'll wrap it up. So this gentleman and the lady at the back. You need to hold the mic up to you and we won't be able to hear you. Like an ice cream. Like an ice cream, exactly. I'm to ask the Why a North Ireland? The average um, mortgage is half the price as, 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 as the loans out. And also, why haven't we introduced a land tax of 90% as is true in Northern Ireland and in most other European countries? It goes into speeding schools, roads, and parts of the as well. Thank you, sir. And, and, and one last Very quickly. Agency, and why have we set up an agency giving prime land to developers at Actually, uh, for, for absolutely nothing. Why, on the other hand, we have. Um, you know something. Another, I'm going to we have another agency, I can't think of it at the moment, that that's, uh, that's uh, selling off top land to, to, to developers and they're charging top prices. Thank you very much for your question, sir. The lady at the back, and then we're going to have to draw to a close. My name is Pauline. Um, Lisa said that the dominant response to homelessness is to warehouse rather than to house, house people. And my question is to Rowan, do you think that the homelessness um, industry is actually a massive profitable industry? And that is why the response of the government is inadequate. I say that because there's an article in the Gazette the Dublin Gazette, which says that Dublin City Council is actually spending 4.5 million more this year on homelessness, and that their total budget will reach 119,338,680 euros. Thank you very much. That's for dealing with homelessness. How many houses could you build for that amount of money? Thank you very much indeed. We're gonna let Ronan try to answer those two questions. <laughs> In, in, in two minutes, uh, and then we'll come back to all of our panelists uh, as we wrap things up. Ronan. Um, uh, okay, on the on the on the latter, uh, actually, it, it, uh, um, a theme for both of those questions is it's not the 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 size of the budget; it's what you do with it. Um, so you're you're right to point out if we've got a lot of money and we're spending it on hotel accommodation, that is definitely not good value for money. Uh, in terms of, 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 of housing those who can't afford to meet the, the cost of their accommodation. And that's true also when we think about the, the Land Development Agency, which was mentioned in the first contribution. Um, it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do to get a site and sell it off um, to a developer. It's about what that partnership looks like and what's going to come out the other end. I'm not saying it's always the right thing to do either. It's how you do these things that really matters. Uh, 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 Sir, please... Uh, um, do that, if you wouldn't mind. It's not a, a to and back and forth. Uh, and and, and uh, your, your first two contributions in relation to a land tax and, and comparisons of, of north and south in terms of costs, 
Um, I, uh, as you probably gathered, I fully agree on a land tax and I fully agree on cost comparisons. I think those are, are two points well made and I would agree with both of them. Um, so I, I leave it there. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else want to respond to anything? Um, I'll just respond um, to, to the lady, um, Holly, on um, warehouse and versus housing. Um, there is actually a critique in literature on you know what is referred to as the homeless industry. You know that, and there have been even claims that uh, the homeless industry, this the homelessness interventions of of you know emergency type interventions, that they have contributed that they that they, that they um, perpetuate homelessness because they don't get people out of homelessness. Um, so that is that is something that, that you know these ideas have been out there, and you are right that um, that uh, that uh, the government is investing a huge amount of money in homelessness services. You know, to no avail it seems in many cases because the situation isn't being resolved. But you see, we can't just have people. You know, we have to have these emergency services for people. We can't have people on the street. Um, and um, I do think it would be fair to say at this point there has been a quite a radical, you know, sort of change in, in, in the way in which the NGO sector is approaching homelessness and managing homelessness. And there's a huge emphasis, a much stronger than previous, you know, decades, let's say, in, in actually exiting people outside home, out of homelessness. And on now we have you know uh, have a, a, a housing first strategy. Of course, the problem with housing first is that we need housing first. Um, <laughs> but um, nonetheless, uh, the that that you know that orientation is there. So it's 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 the whole thing is quite complex. But um, but yeah, I think you make a, a, a valid point if you're talking about the homeless industry. Lisa. Charles, no, no. Okay. Well, listen, we're going to wrap it up, folks. I firstly, I, just a few announcements. Um, on the 18th of October, a new lecture series on 1918 and the New Europe uh, begins. Uh, uh, so, again, we'd love to see you at that. Uh, the poet Paul Muldoon will join us on the 30th of October to deliver the annual Edmund Burke lecture. It's on the poet as citizen, um, and obviously Paul Muldoon is is a fabulous, fabulous speaker. The next Behind the Headlines is on the 5th of November and it's on the crisis of democracy and uh, cultural trauma. Now, the 5th of November is the day before the US midterm elections. Um, talk about a, a, a crisis of democracy. Uh, so I think it'll be a, a very interesting discussion uh, involving actually colleagues from the US, from Colombia. Uh, and then our next session um, in Trinity and the Changing uh, City lecture series will be on the 8th of November on Dublin's migrants, another hugely, hugely important topic. So you're all very welcome at those. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Storm Callum is on its way, but I'm sure everybody will be able to get home safely uh, uh, before the rain starts. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for your questions. I want to thank my team here in the Hub and everybody who's joined us online. But above all, I want to thank our four panellists for four cracking uh, presentations. So if we could all...